I am here this evening to talk about the new atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome uh, order sets. I am a hematologist at uh, St. Michael's Hospital. I'm also um, an associate professor of medicine, laboratory medicine at the University of Toronto. So I do have very important disclosures because I'm going to be talking to you about uh, TTP and hemolytic uremic syndrome with which I do have significant relationships. I uh, was uh, part of a number of clinical trials. I also do uh, presentations on the topic rela on topics related to TTP and HUS. CAP, in fact, has received financial support from Alexian Pharma Canada uh, in the form of an educational grant. And um, the reason this is important is because Alexian Pharma Canada um, is the manufacturer of aculizumab, which I'm going to be talking about today as well. I do want to reassure you that um, there was no industry involvement in the planning or development of this educational content. So order sets are really important because they can guide high quality care uh, especially if they're evidence-based and relating to best practices. And so I'm hoping that the order set that we'll be talking to you about today uh, will be of use. So what are my learning objectives? So first and foremost today, I want to tell you a little bit about TTP and AHUS. I think it's fundamentally important to understand these diseases before we can actually launch into discussion of how to use the actual order set. But really, the most significant uh, objective for tonight is to be able to recognize thrombotic microangiopathy in an adult patient presenting to the emergency room. I am an adult hematologist, um, and pretty much everything I'll be talking to you about um, will be relating to uh, treating adult patients. I will also hopefully, with the use of the order set, uh, guide you towards ordering uh, tests uh, that can help you in diagnosing of the TMA. Okay, so first and foremost, what is a thrombotic microangiopathy? A thrombotic microangiopathy is a clinical syndrome. It's a clinical syndrome that can be caused by a variety of conditions, and it presents with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So microangiopathic hemolytic anemia stands for hemolytic anemia that is associated with fragments or schistocytes on the blood film. It is also marked by thrombocytopenia, so low platelet count, as well as evidence of microvascular thrombosis. Thrombotic microangiopathy is very rare. In Canada, about 200 patients with TMA are treated with plasmapheresis every year. So um, some physicians may go their entire career without encountering a patient with this condition. So when should you be suspecting TMA? Um, well, as I mentioned, you need to have low platelet count. Um, a lot of people think that it has to be like catastrophically low platelet count, but the platelet count may be only mildly abnormal. Same goes for anemia. Anemia can be very mild. A very significant hallmark is presence of fragments or schistocytes on blood film. Um, I don't know if you are able to see my pointer, but you can see at the bottom here that there is a, a blood film, and you can see red cells that look red and normal, and they are spherical, and then you can see these broken apart pieces. This is what we mean by fragments. And when you see these fragments on the blood film, this is what makes you worry about thrombotic microangiopathy. In most hospitals, fragments will be read out by um, the analyzer, so the report may actually show up on your um, lab information system without being verified by hematopathologist, and it's usually hematopathologist who reviews the film the next day, and so the actual um, full report may not come until um, the following day if we're talking, if the patient, you're seeing a patient in the middle of the night, for example. Evidence of hemolysis. Um, so there's a number of tests here that I listed. In fact, it's an exhaustive list. The ones that I find by far the most helpful will be elevated um, LDH. So LDH is the test that is available in every hospital, very fast to get, um, and it's very, very helpful. I also really like heptoglobin, but I realize that in most hospitals, this is a send-out test or a test that is batched, so it is good to order it, but you should not be expecting to get a result and be able to act on the result. The other useful test will be bilirubin, so total bilirubin and direct bilirubin can give you an idea whether indirect bilirubin is elevated, and that's also a marker of hemolysis. 
And then there is this bit about evidence of organ damage by microthrombi. So there are a number of target organs that are involved, uh, kidney, brain, heart, gastrointestinal tract. And for most of these things, we actually have markers that we can assess. So for example, um, if you're worried about uh, kidneys being affected, you can look at creatinine, you can look at proteinuria. Um, for heart, you can measure um, the troponin. For brain, we generally rely on the um, clinical assessment of clinical symptoms. So next slide. This is a very confusing and scary slide, and this is exactly what it's meant to do. Thrombotic microangiopathy has an extraordinarily wide differential diagnosis, and sometimes it takes days to perhaps a week and, or even longer to finally figure out what is going on with the patient. What the patient may have is either TTP or HUS, but in the vast majority of cases, at least based on the data from the big registry um, that originated in Japan, um, greater than 50% would be all these other secondary TMAs. So they're not TTPH, they're not HUS. And uh, in order to diagnose these dis disorders, for the majority of them, you would require to do extensive investigations. But this is not what you would do in the emergency room. So what is, uh, your, what are you supposed to do in the emergency room? Let's go to the next slide. So I would argue that um, the number one priority would be to identify TTP and to refer it appropriately. And the reason um, why TTP is so important to identify and treat right away is because without treatment, TTP is a deadly condition in the overwhelming majority of cases, like 85%, whereas with treatment, you can reduce this mortality to down to 15%. CTP is a type of thrombotic microangiopathy, and it's marked by severe ADMTS13 deficiency. Um, ADMTS13 is a special protein in the blood whose job is to cleave a clotting factor called von Willebrand factor. And when you have severe deficiency of this protein, so activity less than 10%, that's when TTP happens. CTP can be hereditary in nature. That is extraordinarily rare to see in adults, although it does happen, whereas the overwhelming majority of patients that I would treat with CTP would have an autoimmune form. So in other words, they have an IgG autoantibody directed against ADMTS13. And so if, I don't know how well it will play out, if we go to the next slide, there's a little animation, very simplistic animation, that shows you how um, this works. So, in a normal person, you can have um, von Willebrand factor multimers, and they can be small, medium-sized, and large, and even ultra-large. And they all play a role in hemostasis, so they're very, very important. ADMTS13 acts as a cleaver, as you will, and what it does is that when these von Willebrand factor multimers get to very large sizes, they come down and chop them up, and uh, this is how the uh, homeostasis is maintained. Now, if you go to the next slide, you will see what happens if we do not have ADMTS13 available. What happens then is that you have accumulation of these very, very large um, von Willebrand factor multimers. They interact with platelets. They activate platelets. Platelets invite coagulation factors, and what you have is microthrombi. Um, so generally, it's small blood vessels that are involved, and this is why disproportionately the organs that are involved would be heart and kidney. If we go to next slide, um, if you were to look at the acute target organ damage in CTP, you will see that the majority um, of patients would have uh, heart involvement um, as marked by abnormal cardiac enzymes. Um, about uh, half would have um, severe neurological abnormalities, although I take um, issue with calling it severe neurological abnormalities. These can range from headache to transient focal events to being comatose. And um, less than 50% would have some sort of kidney involvement, although it's usually a very, very mild abnormality that you see in patients with CTP. So going to the next slide, um, there are two CTP diagnostic prediction scores that are published. One is called the French score, and the other one is called the uh, plasmic score. 
um, plasma score was developed in the United States, and all and both of them are trying. So the French score is actually very very simple. It has only um, a couple of things that you take into account, such as platelet count and creatinine, essentially. Whereas the plasma score has um, uh, substantially more uh, lab data and history data that you have to input to decide um, whether this is likely to be TTP or not. What I would argue that um, scores are good. However, TTP ultimately is a clinical diagnosis, and treatment has to start right away. RMTS-13 activity is very important to confirm the diagnosis, but it will not be immediately available. Go to the next slide. In fact, RMTS-13 activity is only performed by seven labs in Canada. Uh, I highlighted here St. Michael's Hospital, which is my hospital, and I know that we uh, are probably one of the largest um, labs that run this uh, test. However, um, many hospitals, and I'm sure your hospital as well, has made uh, an arrangement or a contract with one of these institutions to send it out. So there is no excuse not to get ADMTS-13 tested, although the turnaround time will depend whether it's your own institution running it or you're sending it off. The tube that you need for ADMTS-13 testing is a blue top tube, which is a citrate tube used for coagulation. So it's useful to remember that if you've drawn the coags, you can always use the same tube for running the ADMTS-13 test. So let's go to the next slide. So how do you treat this immune TTP? There are three pillars. First, you need to replace um, what's deficient. You need those scissors or that cleaver back, and that's ADMTS-13. And right now, the, most, um, the easiest way we can do it is by subjecting a patient to plasma exchange. We also need to turn off the autoantibody production, so most of these patients receive uh, steroids, and if they don't respond, then rituximab. And then the third pillar is trying to prevent these microthrombi from damaging organs, and the way to do this is to prevent the binding of von Willebrand factor to the platelet. And that is achieved with this new drug called caplicizumab that I will very, very briefly mention. So next slide. The most important thing would be plasmapheresis. Um, so I would say that the cornerstone and the gold standard of therapy is plasmapheresis. It's accomplished with one of those machines. Um, kind of looks like dialysis. Um, it operates slightly differently. So unlike dialysis, this machine actually removes uh, whole blood, uh, centrifuges it, um, keeps back the plasma, and that goes into the waste bag. And then the plasma that is removed is being replaced by plasma from donors, healthy donors. And you have to do this procedure daily until your platelet count normalizes. It needs to start as soon as possible since um, as I said, um, you are risking very significant organ damage or potentially death if the treatment is delayed. We usually use a dialysis line to um, uh, hook up the patient to this machine. And really, the reason we want to do this is to um, replenish uh, ADMTS-13. It can also remove the autoantibody and perhaps remove all these very large DWF multimers, but really the most important job of plasmapheresis is to give as much ADMTS-13 back as possible. And in fact, most patients uh, respond within about a week. What's really important is, to know is that, um, and now that I'm, as I'm speaking, I realize that I should have had uh, a slide on the location of plasmapheresis centers in Canada. So in Canada, there are approximately 40 plasmapheresis centers and I think it would be very important uh, for an emergency physician, I would imagine, to know where would be the nearest plasmapheresis center. Patients with suspected TTP should go to a plasmapheresis center. However, I also understand that some of you may be remote, and uh, a transfer to plasmapheresis center may take um, at least a couple of hours. And if you are in that position that you're remote and it's going to take some hours for that patient to get to a plasmapheresis center and you suspect TTP, then you should start transfusing plasma. How much plasma to transfuse? Um, we would, I would suggest somewhere between two and four uh, bags of plasma or units of plasma, um, but that would depend on how much volume the patient can tolerate. It is also really important to collect that blue top tube for ADMTS-13 activity prior to infusing plasma. If your lab has a setup um, contract to do ADMTS-13 activity, that's great. You can just send it to your lab. The other possibility is just to transport that tube with the patient so the diagnosis can be made in the institution where they receive. Next slide. 
the other first-line treatments would include uh, putting a patient on high-dose um, steroids. Um, the doses of steroids vary all over the place. Again, if you have very strong suspicion of TTP, you are specifically dealing with someone who is presenting with significant organ damage, such as focal deficit or decreased level of consciousness, I would not hesitate to start a patient on high-dose steroids. Um, as I said, rituximab in Canada is usually reserved for a relapsed or refractory setting. However, in Europe and United States, um, if you practice there as well, you will notice that rituximab can also be used up front, uh, meaning as soon as they have arrived in the hematology ward, they would be receiving rituximab. Red blood cell transfusions are really important. Um, with significant hemolysis, these patients' hemoglobin drops quite uh, a bit, and even though their bone marrow is trying to compensate, that may not be enough. And in order to have a plasmapheresis run safely, uh, you need to maintain the hemoglobin at 70 or higher. Platelet transfusions, on the other hand, are considered completely contraindicated unless there is a life-threatening hemorrhage. And the reason for that is, um, time and again, um, studies, case reports show that uh, thrombotic microangiopathy exacerbates upon platelet transfusion. It is also important to remember that even if you do everything right and refer the patient correctly and treat them right away, the acute mortality can still be quite high, up to 20%. And um, we'll go to the next slide. I'm just going to mention um, this one drug that is coming to Canada uh, shortly and is already being used in the United States and uh, Europe. Um, and this is a drug that um, prevents the binding of von Willebrand factor and platelets, and thus prevents the microthrombi from forming in the first place, thus protecting um, the patient while you are getting uh, them treatment for TTP. So uh, this is something that you may see in the future. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. We're going to shift gears and talk briefly about AHUS before we launch into the actual discussion of how to use the um, order set. So HUS, the overwhelming majority of cases that you will encounter probably will be due to stack HUS or um, HUS that is caused by shigatoxin bacteria. About 10% will be due to uncontrolled activation of this alternative pathway of complement system, of which the majority is genetic. And the reason this condition is genetic is these patients have inherited uh, mutations that uh, result in loss of function, so um, complement regulators are knocked out, or gain of function where the effectors of complement system cannot be turned off appropriately. Let's go to the next slide. You will see that even though you may have this uh, genetic mutation, um, it does not guarantee you're going to get the disease, and it's not until your body encounters some significant triggering event that then causes endothelial activation and a problem, um, and um, that's when the AHUS actually happens. In terms of triggers, the most important triggers would be GI infection or upper respiratory tract infection, and in um, women, um, it is uh, pregnancy. Just like TTP, it can affect um, uh, brain, it can affect um, eyes, um, it can affect GI tract. What makes HUS particularly difficult is because there are no established diagnostic criteria tests. So unlike TTP, where there is the Adam TS13, it's a really good test, it's very specific, there's nothing like this for HUS. And usually when you suspect HUS, you must have the TMA, you must have renal dysfunction, and as a minimum, two most important alternative diagnoses must be excluded, which are TTP and shigatoxin producing um, or, or HUS related to shigatoxin producing bacteria. There are a number of potentially helpful tests, and I, you can see them on the screen. Um, I think that um, they will be not useful in the emergency room. Uh, they're not acutely available, and um, this is something that uh, a hematology consultant may order down the road to trying to figure this out. So let's go to the next slide. And so this is what I was trying to get across, is that um, there are a number of systems that are involved with brain and GI tract being by far the most commonly involved. Next slide. So how do you treat this? Well, you can infuse plasma, so to give back the complement regulator that you do not have, uh, or you can plasma exchange. And uh, in this case, um, the reason plasma exchange works is that you're removing the uh, you know, bad effector that you cannot turn off and replacing it with the effector that can be turned off. Unfortunately, the evidence for these interventions 
is really, really weak and um, variable and very much depends on what kind of mutation you have, whether you're going to respond to it or not. Fortunately, we do have a more specific question, and that's aculizumab, which is a humanized monoclonal antibody that uh, essentially prevents um, deposition of complement and uh, binding of the complement and uh, effectors of the complement. So you, uh, the complement may um, bind, but the um, tissue damage will not occur. The only reason, um, and it's effective, it does improve TMA. In other words, it makes your platelets better, it makes your hemolysis better, and it does improve kidney function. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll be able to see the um, combined analysis of at least four studies. Uh, being a very rare disease, we're looking at prospective clinical trials, but they're not RCTs. And so, for example, if you can see under complete TMA response, in a native kidney, about three quarters would achieve complete response, meaning that there is improvement in uh, hematological manifestations as well as uh, kidneys. Um, what's important also to point out is that, uh, um, again, just as emergency physicians, uh, you may encounter patients on eculizumab being treated for AHUS or PNH or perhaps another condition, and uh, they are coming in because they have fever and stiff neck. and um, the, one of the biggest concerns with aculizumab therapy, despite the meningococcal vaccination, is that these patients may develop um, significant meningococcal disease. So if you encounter a patient like that, uh, you know, please uh, treat them uh, well. Please consider meningococcus because um, uh, these patients will require full investigations. This is obviously not a topic of today's conversation, but if you see patients, they usually carry special cards. Um, that are uh, designed to alert the emergency physician, or some would carry actually letters from their own treating physician uh, suggesting that if I have a fever, please contact such and such doctor, or please uh, consider doing an LP if clinically indicated. And of course, treat with broad spectrum antibiotics, trying to cover meningococcus, that's really, really important. All right, so enough of AHUS and TTP, let's move into the uh, order set. Oh, and before we do that, um, just as I promised you, more than 50% will not be either of these deadly things that I've talked about. It could be a whole bunch of other things, and some are deadlier than others, and it may take a long time to sort this out. Uh, so here's just a brief list of some of these um, things um, with um, uh, suggestions of uh, what kind of investigations you may want to do uh, to figure out uh, what is going on with the patient. Okay, next slide. Okay, so on to the order set. Okay, so here's the patient case. That's what you've been waiting for. Uh, it's a 50-year-old female who is seen in ER with complaint of unusually heavy menstrual bleeding. She's previously well. There's no medications or substance use. Her physical exam is entirely normal. And in fact, she looks like any other female with heavy menstrual bleeding. It's a relatively common complaint in ER. And uh, you order your regular lab investigations, perhaps a CBC and some chemistry. And here you go, you get some very unexpected results for a patient presenting like this. Her hemoglobin is 64, her platelets are 37, so you may have expected the hemoglobin of 64 being the fact that she is bleeding and perhaps has chronic iron deficiency anemia due to menorrhagia. You really did not expect the platelets to be 37. Her coags are normal, and uh, her ferritin, for whatever reason, is elevated. Again, you would have expected it to be low, and uh, she's not pregnant, but look at that creatinine. That creatinine is really, really abnormal. And this is someone who is previously well, and in fact, um, you know, if you were, say, for example, at St. Michael's Hospital, you could have probably logged in in the connecting Ontario and easily find that her uh, previous creatinine on record just perhaps a couple of months ago was completely normal, and this is a very distressing finding. Okay, so next slide. So what do we do about this? Could this be TMA? Well, she's got low hemoglobin, but she has many other reasons why she may have low hemoglobin. She does have low platelets. And um, here's where I would say is that as soon as you get this low platelet, unexplained, new finding for this patient, no suspicious history, this is where you need to ask yourself, okay, could this patient have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? And it's an absolute minimum. Of course, you can order all the other tests, and I'll go over the order set in a minute. But the most important things, arguably, would be to add an LDH and to ask for a blood film review to look for fragments. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. 
I did not invent CROT. CROT sounds absolutely awful and distressing, and, um, but it will stick in your mind. So as an emergency physician, what you need to decide, is this CROT or is this not? And what I, meant, what I mean by it, could this be thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura? And if you cannot rule out TTP, in other words, you have something that looks like thrombotic microangiopathy, and that may be enough in itself, but in addition, you also have some evidence of organ damage, like abnormal creatinine, like neurological symptoms, like a positive troponin that um, you know, makes no sense. And there are no alternative diagnosis evidence. So this patient is not coming in with a known history of disseminated uterine malignancy. She is not known to have leukemia. There is nothing immediately obvious that explains what's happening with her. I think you cannot rule out TTP. And the safest thing to do is to refer a patient like this to a plasmapheresis center. Um, so usually I get these through critical um, or by you can do this by consulting your local hematologist and then local hematologist escalating it uh, further to a plasmapheresis center. Sometimes you may not have a hematologist, so you will be escalating through the internal medicine specialist that uh, does consults in the ER. But that's not where your job stops because, yes, it may not be um, CTP. Um, it could be some other TMA. Um, and they may also need to be referred. These patients may have HUS. They may have uh, antiphos catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And all of these conditions also require treatment. But they don't necessarily need to go to a plasmapheresis center. OK, so let's go to the next slide. Here are some of the pearls. I, they're not so much pearls as motherhood statements, and probably reflect some of some of them reflect common misconceptions, and some of them just one of those commandments. So, if you see a patient with a new finding of significant thrombocytopenia, and it's new and unexplained, this patient should not leave your emergency room without you ordering hemolytic markers in a blood cell. Beware of a patient who is coming in with new thrombocytopenia and acute focal neurological deficit. That could be TTP. This could be AHUS. You need to rule out TMA. Another very, very common, common misconception is that I think most of us remember from medical school that patients with TTP come in and they're comatose and they're seizing and acute kidney failure and they have high fever. Well, in reality, a patient with TMA may look really, really well initially. And if you don't do anything, they will get worse on you quite rapidly. So do not be fooled by their uh, very stable appearance initially. And I guess the other very common misconception is that when you hear thrombotic microangiopathy, you think that they're presenting with overwhelming clots. But remember, these patients have a low platelet count, and they may present with mucocutaneous bleeding like in this case where this woman presented with very significant vaginal bleeding. OK, let's go to the next slide. OK, so you call the lab, you add the LDH, you add a blood film, and um, the blood film comes back as anemia with red blood cell fragmentation, suggestive of microangiopathic hemolysis. And they, in fact, confirm that there is marked thrombocytopenia. LDH is grossly abnormal. 3,200, that's way more than your reference range. Remember, LDH has many reference ranges in different labs, so it's really, really important to, um, when you're speaking to an outside consultant, mention the range, uh, because uh, some ranges can, normal range can go up to 600. So 600 can be normal for your lab, but could be grossly abnormal, say, in my lab. So this 50-year-old woman, unexpectedly, is not just iron deficient menorrhagia, she has anemia, she's got thrombocytopenia, she's got fragments on film, and she's got a very high LDH. She likely has TMA. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, I crossed out diagnosis because that's not what we're aiming for. We're trying to decide what would be the best disposition for this patient. Where should she be going from the emergency room? So does she have, so she already has TMA. We're worried about this, so she needs to be referred. But does she also have evidence of organ damage? Her creatinine is grossly abnormal. We know that previously it was normal. So yes, she has evidence of organ damage. Um, the other test that you may want to consider is uh, do a urine dip to see for um, proteinuria or hemoglobinuria. What about troponin? Well, 
it's not the type of person that we would have ordinarily thought about ordering troponin, so we should probably go ahead and add it to our blood work. And you go back and you confirm, no, she doesn't have any neurological symptoms or signs. She really is um, fine. Is there an alternative diagnosis? Well, she doesn't have DIC. Um, she um, does not have hypertensive crisis. Her blood pressure is normal. She's not pregnant, so this is not health. And uh, she's not septic. So she is one of those cases where you cannot rule out TTP, and so you should refer her. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now on to the um, AHUS um, uh, actual order sets. So we've already covered the fact that you should always suspect TMA in somebody who presents with thrombocytopenia, and that should trigger you to order investigations for hemolysis and order a blood film review to rule out or rule in the presence of red blood cell fragments. And obviously, if you confirm TMA, that is enough to refer this patient to either an internist or hematologist to decide on further disposition. So how do we use the uh, order set? So initial investigation, CBC, that will give you a hemoglobin and a platelet count. As I said, once you find that low platelet count, you should request a blood film that will give you fragments. Reticulocyte count is useful because it's usually elevated in patients with hemolysis, so it may be a very useful marker. When you are encountering a patient with new thrombocytopenia, you should order at least a couple of hemolytic markers, so LDH will be very helpful, as well as uh, bilirubin. As I said, you can order a heptoglobin, and in fact, go ahead and order it. It's a very useful test, but don't expect to get that result right away. But you will get the LDH and bilirubin quite quickly, which will allow you to triage. Liver enzymes are there, too. And you may ask, well, why am I ordering liver enzymes? Well, first and foremost, uh, GI tract and pancreatic involvement is actually quite common in TMA, so that's one reason. But the other reason is that if you see a very significant elevation in bilirubin and, and abnormal liver enzymes, well, then you can't rely on LDH as being a marker of hemolysis. Remember, LDH is nonspecific. And if you have grossly elevated liver enzymes, then you can't trust that LDH um, is elevated due to hemolysis and is not just a marker of liver damage. So I actually really like to um, have the liver enzymes to compare. If you see that LDH is 3,000 and the ALT is, say, very, very mildly elevated, you know that you have to suspect hemolysis and not liver disease. Coagulation screen is very important. I think most of you would order INR APTT to rule out DIC. Uh, I think fibrinogen uh, is very important also to order because it may give you uh, an idea about, say, compensated hemolysis. So that's another very useful marker. What about, so now this is just the basic things for TMA. What about target organ damage assessment? So we already talked about um, the assessing the kidneys. So BUN and creatinine is a good uh, test of kidney function, as well as you may want to do uh, urine RNM to look for hemoglobin urea. Um, uh, so remember presence of um, uh, positive for RBC, but you don't see any RBC, so the pigment is uh, hemoglobin, very useful uh, to distinguish hemoglobin urea from hematuria. And uh, also you may see that there is significant uh, protein um, leakage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, troponin very important to order and sometimes may be a very important clue for TMA and amylase and lipase, again, to further investigate uh, potential pancreatic involvement. So let's go to the next slide. So what can you actually sort out in ER? Well, you can probably sort out DIC in ER. Um, usually you would be dealing with a high-risk patient, so someone with sepsis or someone with disseminated malignancy. Uh, you've ordered the, um, your um, coagulation studies and they're suggestive of uh, uh, DIC. Um, hopefully you can pick up sepsis with multi-organ system failure uh, by on uh, clinical grounds as well as obviously cultures and lactate. Malignant hypertension is very obvious. Malignant hypertension can present with what looks like TMA uh, and ob obviously requires referral to uh, an internist and uh, with blood pressure control, uh, malignant hypertension will settle and the TMA may resolve. If it does not, that could mean that there is another underlying condition that needs to be investigated. 
how preeclampsia you may be able to decipher in the ER. Um, so any uh, pregnant patient, second trimester to postpartum, presenting with hypertension, proteinuria, elevated liver enzymes, you should have very high level of suspicion for help in preeclampsia. Endocarditis is a very significant mimicker of TMA, although not a TMA itself, like new murm or high-risk patients, so IV drug use, mechanical valve, um, and obviously echocardiogram blood cultures will be very useful there. Vitamin B12 deficiency, it's interesting. I never used to see it, but I see it more and more frequently. I see it in the elderly who do not have very good nutrition. I also see it in a lot of young people who are uh, vegan or otherwise uh, diet-restricted, and um, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency can look an awful lot like TTP and can be diagnosed with a simple blood test without necessitating uh, critical transfers uh, to different institutions. Pancreatitis, um, again, can be sorted out on the clinical picture as well as um, liver enzymes imaging. And then a lot of um, drugs of abuse can mimic TMA or actually present with TMA. So those are the things that you can probably do in the emergency room. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so let's just concentrate a little bit on these other initial investigations. So what would I order for this patient in question? My 50-year-old female with um, uh, significant menorrhagia. So I don't know if I particularly need calcium, magnesium, phosphate, and albumin. Um, it might be important if I decide to plasma exchange her. That would be actually very important. She definitely needs group and screen, and perhaps you can argue group and screen and cross match because her hemoglobin is low. You will obviously assess her symptoms. Um, the other very important fact now is that in most um, hospitals now, um, if you order a group and screen and the patient does not have a historic on record, um, a second specimen will be required to, uh, for ABO verification, so you may be uh, required to draw two specimens, group and screen, and then ABO verification before you can give this patient plasma, for example. Ferritin is uh, useful, obviously she's presenting with menorrhagia, but ferritin can also, is a good uh, inflammatory marker and may give you an idea that something else is going on. As I already mentioned, vitamin B12, super useful. Uh, to differentiate vitamin B12 deficiency from everything else. The dimers may be particularly useful if you're suspecting, uh, say, DIC. Uric acid is like a poor person's um, assessment for uh, cellular turnover that you may see in malignancy. Um, I am not so sure that this is the time to be ordering it for this patient. Um, talk screens are important. Um, you know, this patient denied any drug history, but um, again, she might, it might be useful to assess just to make sure that, um, that in fact, uh, she was truthful about that history. Um, a lot of infections like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C may um, either mimic TMA, cause TMA, um, and so might be useful to order. I'm not so sure if this is appropriate to be ordering right in the emergency room, so I probably wouldn't click it for that. Um, if there is fever and there is any suspicion of um, uh, infection, then obviously appropriate cultures might be very useful. And um, I would imagine that in any patient with suspicion, any female patient of childbearing potential by years and who is presenting with TMA, you absolutely should be doing um, a beta ACG, like a pregnancy test, because it's a very significant uh, exacerbating condition. In terms of other investigations, um, ECG might be useful. Um, even if you have significant TMA, ECG may be normal uh, because it's microvascular thrombosis rather than big territorial infarctions, but may be useful, especially if um, you find that troponin is abnormal. Abdominal ultrasound to assess kidney function may be important, uh, the kidney size to, to determine whether um, uh, it's a chronic uh, kidney problem versus something acute may be helpful. Abdominal ultrasound may also be helpful to diagnose pancreatitis. Um, Anyone who is presenting with neurological deficit and thrombocytopenia should have some sort of imaging done, and I think CT is a reasonable uh, place to start, although I would argue that if you're suspecting TTP and the patient is not looking well, I would not delay transfer to get a CT scan. And obviously an echo is a useful test that you may order to um, rule out um, uh, endocarditis. Next uh, slide, please. So um, this is my list of we'll need to sort out later. And uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see a much nicer arrangement that was done at the, in, the, uh, in the order set uh, because it actually lists them, all of these conditions, uh, 
and um, in parallel with what investigations are required. So a much better way to present it. Uh, and it may guide you in further investigation. Next slide. What about supportive management? Okay, so think about our 50-year-old female who has uh, TMA that you're going to be referring because you cannot rule out TTP. So uh, inserting a peripheral IV may be useful. She may need a blood transfusion. So as I said already, group and screen, AB verification samples should be sent. Uh, she may also need plasma infusion. Um, if you're really suspicious and the transfer may take a long time, so again, for that, in that regard, group and screen and, um, uh, and ABO verification um, tests are useful. It is also um, important to not forget to draw ADAMTS13 before you do any transfusion. There is small amounts of plasma even in red blood cells, uh, and obviously if you're going to be giving plasma, you should definitely do ADAMTS13 first. And the other really, really important uh, issue is do not forget not to give platelets. It's a very common thing when a uh, patient is transferred to me with neurological symptoms and severe thrombocytopenia, clear um, concern for CTP, and I realized that the patient was uh, transfused with two adult doses of platelets um, in, by the sending institution. If you're ever in doubt, um, please uh, consult with your hematologist, your internist, uh, to get further guidance. Okay, next slide. And I think the next slide is talking about all of the possible consults. So um, if you don't have access to a hematologist, uh, then internal medicine specialist, pretty much any TMA will require an internal medicine consult. Uh, from there onwards, uh, if you're suspecting TTP, hematology is a very important consult, and your local hematologist may then need to discuss the case with a, plasma, a hematologist from a plasmapheresis center to negotiate transfer. If you have any... Um, um, evidence of acute kidney failure. Nephrologist is very useful, especially if you worry about the volume overload and there are indications for dialysis. Obstetrician may be very useful if you're dealing with someone uh, who is pregnant or immediately postpartum and suspecting help or other complications. Um, I think I will um, stop here. There is a number of references attached to the order set um, that you can review. There are good review articles um, to gain uh, more um, understanding of this. And uh, I will pause for questions now. I'm sorry it was a whirlwind, and I'm sorry <laughs> we kind of started with uh, some uh, technical issues. But um, I hope you enjoyed it and you found it useful. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavinsky. Um, we were, had planned to use the presenter chat uh, to ask questions. However, that doesn't appear to be working. So perhaps people can use the raise their hand icon, which is at the top of your bar, if you have a question, and then we can call on you and you can unmute your phone and ask your question. Okay, Doc, uh, John Rizzos. Are you able to unmute, unmute your phone? Press pound or star six if you haven't used your phone's methodology. Does anyone else have a question? Jessica Pittman, yes. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear yep. you. Hi, great. I've got a question from Ottawa. The question is, how important is ordering the amylase? Should it be ordered if the patient does not have abdominal pain? Okay, that's a really good question. No, I, so um, what I would say is that your ordering of these tests should be guided by the clinical presentation. So if you have no abdominal pain, um, I probably wouldn't order amylase or lipase. However, uh, in stark contrast, I would always order a troponin in a person who you suspect of having TMA, whether they have any symptoms or any risk factors, and you will be surprised how frequently you're going to find that troponin to be positive. Um, do not expect it to be really high. Um, it's usually very mildly elevated, but it's also a, a very important clue to diagnosis in the emergency room. So no abdominal pain, no GI symptoms. I would not uh, recommend ordering um, amylase or lipase or proceeding with uh, you know, uh, ultrasounds, et cetera. <laughs> 
Hi, it's John Rizos. I'm sorry, I wasn't on. Um, can can uh, the doctor put on the uh, references slide once more? Certainly. Sorry. Thank you. There we go. I also would like to say, just reiterate that um, AMA is very, very rare, and um, if and sometimes it's really hard to maintain uh, competency or comfort with things that are so ridiculously rare. But because the stakes are so high, um, that if you're going to walk away with a single point, that would be next time I see a patient with low platelet count. Um, that is new and there is no immediate explanation, I am going to order LDH and ask for a blood film. And then how you deal with what you find, maybe that's when you reach out to your internist or hematologist for help. Um, I have had phenomenal um, referrals from emergency rooms with very, very um, <laughs> detailed workups. Um, but I've also had some very rudimentary ones because um, there were a ton of sick patients, um, there was great pressures, they couldn't do any more investigations, um, but they did the right thing by reaching out, and so I was able to guide them how to transfer the patient. In the end, it was the right call. Are there any further questions? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pavinsky, for your time. It was a wonderful presentation. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank, thank you so much. much. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful evening.